Awesome. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, thank you all for coming. I am super excited for tonight's panel event um, and and for, for you all for being here. For those of you who don't know me, um, if you've been to other Women Who Code events, maybe my face is familiar. Uh, but I'm Jen. I am one of your area directors for Women Who Code Boulder, Denver. So me, along with Dom, Rafna, Jordan, one of our panelists, uh, and Grace, we oversee all of your events across the area, which are all virtual right now and still thriving uh, with great content. So I just want to thank Hannah from General Assembly for partnering uh, and putting on this event with us and for all of our panelists who volunteer their time tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it and are excited to hear your work from home wisdoms. Uh, for those of you who don't know Women Who Code, we are a global nonprofit and our mission is to inspire women to excel in technology careers. And our vision is to create a world in which women are representative as technical executives, founders, VCs, board members, and software engineers. And we do this in a variety of ways, uh, all through events uh, like hackathons, panel events like this, uh, lightning talks, networking events, so uh, lots of cool ways of just getting women together. And then you can go to the next slide. So, I really want to briefly touch on our code of conduct, especially as uh, events are virtual. It's really important to just say that uh, this is a safe, harassment-free environment. Um, and Women Who Code is an inclusive community dedicated to providing an empowering experience for everybody who participates in or supports our community. So our events are intended to inspire women to excel in technology careers and anyone who is there for that purpose is totally 100% welcome, but we don't t tolerate harassment in any way. So if you have any issues or feel uncomfortable, even in the virtual setting, uh, feel free to privately message me or Hannah in the Zoom chat, um, and you can read our full code of conduct at the link. And then lastly, uh, please stay connected with us if this is your first Women Who Code event or if you've been to many before. We'd love to see you at another event. You can find all of our events on meetup.com. We have lots of reoccurring events. Uh, we have a monthly JavaScript group, a career returnship group that all meet monthly or bi-monthly. And then I just wanted to highlight two events that are coming up that I'm really excited for. On the 14th, uh, Jordan actually is leading our Puppies and Portfolios event where you'll see uh, building a Jamstack site Gatsby and Netlify, which is going to be awesome. And then on the 30th, you can restore your mental health and create a resilient mindset. Uh, so that's also going to be great. So you can find those events on Meetup. Uh, I also really encourage you all to join our Slack community. Uh, fun fact, that's how we found a lot of our panelists. Uh, so to join that, just scan this QR code. You can, that'll take you to our link tree with all of our uh, website links, like our Twitter, Facebook, um, and a form to fill out to join our Slack. Or you can just email me uh, at denver at womenwhocode.com and I'll add you to the Slack group right away. Uh, so yeah, that's all for me. I'll pass it over to Hannah. Thanks, Jen. I'm gonna need to know more about this puppies and portfolios event. Just saying that right now, we're gonna talk about this after. <laughs> Like Jordan, do you have more to say? Because I feel like I need to know more. Uh, my dogs are around here somewhere. And uh, pre-COVID, pre they ran the event. So we'd hang out at like coffee shops and bars. My dogs would come um, and I'd help people with portfolios. It's less puppies now that it's online, but they usually come by and say hello. I don't know where they are. Come here. You come here? No. <laughs> you come here. Like, well, let me hello? know if you need to borrow a puppy. I'm happy to donate mine. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, oh, oh hi. Pebbles. She's my little <laughs> sassy girl. She loves running events um, because she loves being the center of attention. So oh, she, hey, she Pebbles. walks around in front of people, gets between them and their computers and is like, hi, I'm here. You may pet me. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. <laughs> uh, so just wanted to set a couple meeting norms along with puppies are welcome. 
<laughs> um, that you are on a Zoom webinar right now, so you probably won't be able to see yourself, but how you can interact with us and the panelists is you can use the chat functionality for general commentary and you can use the Q&A when you have questions. So uh, we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the panel. So anything you'd like to ask our panelists, feel free to toss in the Q&A. Jordan, I feel like you have one more dog to introduce. <laughs> yes, this is her genetic brother, Cub. Oh, hi, Cub. <laughs> uh, he's, he's a ragamuffin today. He needs a haircut, but very still cute. like him anyway. He's still cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this event will be recorded and transcribed. So um, everything that you're seeing here today, if you want to be able to come back to this event and watch it later, you will be able to. Um, any resources that we mentioned during this event today, we'll make sure we shoot out in a follow up. Um, and if you'd like to get involved in General Assembly, you can check out our website at ga.co slash education. For those of you who don't know what General Assembly is, uh, General Assembly is a global education company. We help um, people find the work that they love through education. And how we do that is through immersive boot camps. So we have um, software engineering boot camps, user experience design boot camps. We also have data science boot camps. We do um, part-time courses as well, where you can do it in the evenings and learn a new skill. Um, we also do short form classes. So if you just want to get some new skills on the weekends or in the evenings, we offer those as well. But one of my favorite things that I do at GA is uh, bring together these lovely events where we get to have some thought leaders talk about what they're doing in these crazy times. So I'd love to introduce our panelists. I actually haven't introduced myself. Uh, so my name is Hannah. I'm the local marketing producer for General Assembly Denver. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and I've been at GA for a little over a year and I absolutely love it. Um, so I will be moderating the event tonight and I'm very excited to get these wonderful ladies perspective. Um, Kelsey, I'm gonna kick it over to you. I'd love for you to introduce yourself. Hi, um, my name is Kelsey Maidel. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a software engineering manager at a company called Handshake right now. Um, we help connect um, students with uh, early career positions. So the goal, with the goal of um, trying to democratize opportunity um, early on in people's careers, which is a pretty sweet mission. Um, in some previous roles, I've, uh, I've worked at some companies that you'd recognize and some companies that maybe you haven't. Um, big one being Wayfair.com online home goods re retailer where I got to watch um, a scale from an engineering department of about 150 people to when I left, we had about 700 people. Um, and managing those growing teams is definitely one of my passions. It's been really fascinating to be forced to go home and still trying to to grow and, and foster a team and I'm excited to be here to talk about it tonight. We're all so excited to hear that. I'm very thrilled. Uh, Jordan, how about you? Uh, so I'm a front end developer for a kind of business to business company working in the uh, I guess business business space dealing with like retailers and suppliers and agencies and moving product around. Uh, it's, kind of weird place to wrap your head around. Um, so I've been doing that. Uh, previously, I uh, kind of in the idea uh, or along the lines of with remote, um, I've taught boot camps as a remote instructor and in person. Um, so I kind of have that perspective as well. Um, but I do a lot of community work. I'm one of the other directors, like Jen mentioned, for the um, Boulder Denver area Women Who Code group. So all kinds of things all over the place. <laughs> and all of it's remote now. Thank you, Jordan. Appreciate it. Uh, Janani, how about you? Hi, everybody. I'm Janani Vasudevan. Um, I'm currently an engineering manager in Microsoft here in Boulder. I joined Microsoft uh, 16 years ago, straight out of college back in Microsoft India. And, you know, I've worked in different roles as an engineer, as an engineering lead and a program manager. And right now, uh, I lead two teams in Boulder and three teams in San Francisco. So I think the remote thing is something that I'm I'm kind of starting to kind of uh, get get used to. Uh, our team sits along with customers and we work on solutions that uh, where we code along with them. So one of the goals is to ensure that we upskill 
the customers and the engineers on their side, along with delivering on solutions. So it's really increasing trust in Microsoft and Azure. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. And I saw a lot of folks saying, hey, we're, look, we're looking for software engineer positions. I'm really looking to grow my team here in the next you know, year or so. So uh, I'd love to connect with all of you on LinkedIn. Thanks, Janani. We are, I believe we are starting a um, networking spreadsheet. And I know that it's been kind of a fun thing that we've done where you can just like toss your name, your role, and like your LinkedIn if you'd like. Um, that will be just thrown in the chat here in just a second. Um, Annalise, would you like to go? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Annalise Lynch. I'm a senior software engineer with Parsley. I've been remote for about four years. I chose to be remote. Um, and I'm loving it and I'm happy and excited to share uh, my experiences. Uh, my company is a content analytics platform um, and I joined and the entire engineering team was remote. Um, so I did my first couple of years remote international doing the digital nomad life and moving to different countries and enjoying my late 20s. Um, and I now live in Boulder and I'm doing my master's in statistics and machine learning engineering. Um, and now that is fully remote, so I've learned how to adjust to that. Um, so I'm looking forward to just talking about everything I've learned in the past two years being on a remote team. Thank you so much. We're so excited to hear your perspective. Even before this, I was like, I'm going to learn something. <laughs> Get some good takeaways. Uh, with that being said, we're going to kind of kick into the panel, but I think before we start, would love to get um, the audience's perspective and let us know maybe like one thing that you're really hoping to learn from tonight. So feel free to just take a moment and throw something in the chat of what you're really hoping to take away from our speakers tonight, because I think that will help us make sure we're navigating this conversation correctly. That's great, how to make a human connection during this time. Yep, feeling isolated. I definitely have felt that during this time. Work-life balance, great. <laughs> Kimberly, I think it is okay to hate working from home. I think there are some people that don't like it. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much for sharing. See, Kelsey's already with you on this one. Great. Thank you so much for sharing, everyone. Um, I think we're going to try and incorporate those throughout this event. So keep your eyes peeled. Uh, I think what I'd like to start with, um, for everyone, I'm going to pass this around, but what has this transition to the switch to remote? I know some of you are not fully or were fully remote before this, but what's kind of the biggest adjustments that you felt um, coming coming into this new environment. And even if you were remote, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what it's been like just changing the dynamic with your teams and stuff like that. Um, so Annalise, I'm gonna kick it over to you to start. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to start. Um, I think the first thing that I had trouble just like wrapping my mind around was the importance of arbitrary schedules. So even if it seems arbitrary to go for a walk to like start your day or arbitrary to, to do your like little five minute workout, it is so important for your brain and your body to like recognize that that's the start of something or recognize that that's the end of something. So I think that was my biggest adjustment is I hadn't quite figured out what I needed, like my body and just my, with my team. Um, so that was the first bit. The second thing when I first joined uh, my company is it took me a really long time to get used to reading everything in Slack as opposed to hearing things in an office. Um, and I, I, I luckily like recognized that in my first week and I was like, whoa, this is overwhelming. There's so much stuff to read. I'm never going to catch up. I'm never going to be a part of the team. I like, I don't understand how am I supposed to consume this much information all the time. Um, but it took some getting used to and just knowing that it was okay to just not pay attention to Slack for a few hours and to mark myself as async 
Um, so that those are my two big two big adjustments was the arbitrary time schedule or seemingly arbitrary time schedule and reading everything instead of hearing everything. That's a really good point. Who'd like to hop in next? I can go in next. If that's yeah. So I think. Um, for me, it was really, uh, I have never worked remotely. So I think the biggest change for me was I really miss those hallway conversations or the uh, the coffee chats. I mean, I really, I mean, it was, it's probably good for my health. I drink much less coffee now, but I think it wasn't good for my mental health. I realized that I was less productive the first few weeks. And even though I was sitting in the same place for like eight hours or maybe even more than what I spent at work, and then I started realizing the importance of actually taking breaks or like, you know, kind of having more discipline, like even if you're, if you really don't have those timelines like set up on you. So that has been my biggest adjustment and, and like not having some of those um, just spontaneous conversations happening. I think to build on that a little bit, sounds like maybe a little bit of a manager problem for sure. Um, in my past life, when I had meetings from nine o'clock in the morning until five o'clock in the afternoon, some of them would be one-on-ones or smaller group meetings. And we could be like, let's have this over lunch. Let's go take a walk around the block. Let's get coffee. Let's do a thing. And um, now if I need to meet with somebody, um, I either have to convince me to like use the ancient technology that is the cell phone um, and actually make a call or, um, you know, we sit on Zoom and I sit at my desk and we stare at each other. And I think after the first three weeks or so, I realized that I just spent all day, every day, like at my desk, maybe I'd go into the kitchen for lunch and then like going to the bathroom. And that was it for 10 hours a day, um, which, was so, 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 so very different. Um, and I think I discovered a little bit what Annalise was saying, where like, I just have to build in, like, I am taking my dog for a walk right now. I'm gonna take a five minute break and do something else. Um, can you call me and I'll take a walk around the block while we talk on our phones, um, those sorts of habits. That's so true. I feel like during this time, you really have to like, I feel like the, the classic phone call is really coming back. <laughs> Jordan, how about you? Um, for, for me, the biggest adjustment was since I was working from home all the time and everybody else is working from home, like needing to take time off was like a really weird balance. Like, I'm just going to sit at home anyway. So why do I need to take the time off? Um, and it took me a couple months of like just everything that's going on with COVID. Like even if you're not getting sick or anything else, it's just a lot mentally to be dealing with every, you know, just kind of the whole environment right now. Um, and that it's okay to still take <laughs> days off and take that mental health day because you just need it um, has been a big thing. Uh, it's, it's also just been a big adjustment. No one on my team was used to being remote. And uh, we started off trying to act like we were not remote by like literally sitting in Zoom calls for eight hours a day so that while we're working, we can talk to the whole team um, and quickly learning that that was not productive in a home environment. <laughs> yeah, but. Yeah, I think you make a really good point. I think that like it's been a it's been a big transition for teams that were not used to this at all to go into totally remote. Um, and I think that there are things that are like that you really enjoyed when you're in the office versus you're out of the office. So Kelsey, maybe you can kind of tell me what is some aspects from working from home that you've, cause you raised your hand earlier and you're like, I really don't enjoy this setting. What could you tell us a little bit about, what you've kind of struggled with or what you're kind of still grappling with during this time. Yeah, um, I think I was talking about this, something similar the other day to one of my friends. And I think just a really good illustration of this is at a previous job, when you first started as an engineer, they asked you a bunch of questions. And one of the questions is like, what music do you like to listen to while you're coding? And my answer was like, the sound of everybody else's voices talking around me. Um, that is, I've never been a like, put your headphones on and code, even when I was coding person. And especially as a manager, I 
derived so much value out of just hearing what other people were talking to each other about. Um, and when you come into a new company and I saw a question about onboarding, you're, you're trying to learn things again, like I think especially as a manager where my hands are not actually in the code, I pick up a lot through osmosis and just hearing other people talk about stuff. And, um, and I started my latest role in January. So to go home three months later, um, was a, a pretty quick transition to not having those conversations um, that I was used to listening to and hoping to use to, to kind of learn by osmosis. Um, so that was really, really hard. And then um, we already, um, I already brought up also like just not getting a break. Um, the part where there's, there's no change. <laughs> I'm just sitting at my computer in my desk from first thing to the morning until last thing in the evening. Um, and also, and I think this is more of a COVID thing than a working remotely thing, but um, but trying to figure out how to set those boundaries on my work day because I'm not doing anything else in the morning. I don't have my commute where I can like ride my bike into work um, or I don't have track practice anymore in the evenings and missing all of that and trying to set a new schedule for myself was really hard and, and remains hard because life kind of continues to change every day. Yeah, and I think you touched on like two really big things that I've been seeing from the audience too is like maintaining and cultivating those like relationships and those, that like work dynamic, but also like setting routines and setting kind of these breaks. Um, Janani, I'd love to get your perspective a little bit on how you're continuing to foster these relationships or making sure that you're still building that like team culture during this time. Sure. Before that, I'd like to kind of talk about something uh, one of my team members presented in All Hands last week, which is so relevant, and I think it's it just was eye-opening. Apparently, there was a Harvard study for adult development that was done, and that was an 80-year study that started in 1938, and it covered about 1,300 subjects. And, and uh, you know, the conclusion of the study was that happiness is really something that, you know, folks get when you nurture your relationships. I mean, be it at work or home or yourself, self-care. I think that's, you know, it was interesting to kind of talk about that. So yeah, I think uh, it, it is challenging to kind of, you know, get the same level of um, in engagement or same level of rapport with people when we're working remote. But there are some things that, you know, we have done that have really helped. Uh, so we, if you have a lot of virtual, somebody talked about virtual happy hours and virtual lunches. So we do kind of set some time up, like every Friday, uh, one o'clock, 1 p.m. MST and 12 p.m. Uh, Pacific time is, is our virtual a lunch like everybody joins in we try to make it a point that we don't talk about work we talk about the wildfires in san francisco the freak snow here or you know people's plants gardening and everything but it, it's just really good because we kind of have that time to get to know each other and understand like where everyone's coming from a couple of my teams also did a virtually or sorry a socially distant picnic so they grabbed food from you know um you know uh, one of the restaurants and then they went to a park and then just sat like six feet apart. They said that was so good because they were seeing people after like six months and it was just so amazing. And uh, I, fe I felt like, you know, all of them, like the next one-on-ones I had with them, they were like so chirpy. They felt like, you know, they had like, had their spirits had been lifted up. So that's that's something. And we're also looking at some virtual morale events for, I mean, I, I just found out Airbnb online experiences. I don't know if folks knew about it, but it's awesome. They have some virtual escape rooms virtual chocolate tasting, that's my team's favorite. So things like that, that's like really cool. But I think finally there, there was one, one thing that I felt as you know, a, a good learning for me as a manager is uh, my manager sent out an email to my entire uh, team saying, hey, we know what's going on with all of this, this uh, natural calamities, COVID, political unrest. And it was a time when we had the Black Lives Matter protests and everybody was kind of feeling down. He sent out a mail saying, uh, we are going to move to a people first approach. So we are going to make sure that we are slowing down on our engagements. We're going to add a lot more breaks between our engagements. We're going to kind of focus on people first time off. Uh, but also, you know, setting expectations that 
we are probably going to be fully remote or we are going to be remote until January 2021. So I think that helped kind of remove the doubt in certain people's mind in terms of, okay, what about lease expiry or do I have to move back into the city, especially for people in San Francisco where the rents are high. So I, I think that, you know, hearing that was really good for the team in terms of, okay, you know, my my director sending me a message saying that, you know, this it's a people first approach we're going to go to. So yeah, there is, a, you know, a, a spoken, um, you know, th assumption of where we're going to do. So I think those were some things that have helped, you know, the team come together, but then also like someone brought up like checking in like often with people. I think that's also really important uh, as a, not just as a manager, but as a peer in terms of, hey, how are you doing? How are things, you know, is, this, is there something that you would like to talk to and all of that. So I think those were some of the, uh, things I have. Annalise, I saw you raise your hand earlier. I would love for you to chime in. Oh, I was um, reading some of the questions that were coming in about like how to connect and feel like you're like still with your team and maintain company culture. Um, and one thing that we had to adjust to as a company was our retreats. So because we're remote, we usually do at least an annual retreat with the whole company and then maybe uh, an annual retreat with like the business or the product teams and we had to remove to virtual retreats um, and we didn't want to lose the retreat style and the retreat culture and just the time to like hang out together instead of you know work and push code and <laughs> fix bugs um, so we came up with a, a new system this year and it worked really well we um, instead of spending time in slack we started up a discord uh, room where we could watch movies together and like hop in you can like hop into different like channels to like that are auditory channels or you just like pop in talk to people and you can see who's there um so there are definitely products out there to facilitate that um feeling of being able to walk into a room and talk to someone and there's another one that we did last week where like you have an old, an avatar and you're walking around the room and you can like sit at the poker table and play poker or you can only talk to the people that are around you to, like uh, mimicking a room um, so I think uh, those products are out there to, to enhance the virtual experience of maintaining culture. It's just really important for the company to prioritize that. Um, so and I'm lucky enough to work for a company that's like, yes, we will set aside time where you are not going to be working on a project and instead you're going to be working on your relationships with your colleagues and just hanging out and shooting the shit or shooting, shooting the stuff. <laughs> well, I that's feel awesome. like you guys... Oh, go ahead, Kelsey. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Just, I thought of this one tiny thing. We got, we had some folks comment that spending kind of unstructured time on Zoom or video chats was not necessarily a recharging experience. And um, so one thing that my team has had pretty good success with, um, I don't know, your mileage may vary, but we actually all get together Mondays now, like at lunch from 12 to one, we happen to all be in Denver, so we don't have time zone problems, but uh, we set aside the hour and we do the Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle together. So it's kind of like a brain challenge. You don't really have to be on the screen, but you can still be like solving a problem and it's just easy and it's fresh every week and it's there. And that's been like a very good um, rapport building, team bonding, like activity just to sort of keep us all together. Okay, I'll add something as well. Yes. Um, so when you're just an employee and you're not management and it's harder to kind of promote some of these changes and like get that community going. Um, one thing that's really been kind of a, I guess, saving grace for me um, is finding these communities outside of work to build the relationship with other people um, like other programmers um, who are kind of going through the same kind of stuff, um, whether it's through women who code or other meetups that I've event attended um, and finding other ways to kind of build my community. Um, outside of work when it, when, when work doesn't seem to be interested in fostering that type of kind of community and um, connections anymore. Um, it's also hard for me because I'm the only front end person on my team. Uh, so I write JavaScript and everybody else at the company writes C sharp. Um, so I don't really have to interact with my team very often. Um, and so it's just gotten worse with COVID and, um, just using other outlets as, uh, you know, my getting my social in <laughs> um, has been really, really important. And, you know, fi finding other people who are programming, I can still talk about like struggles I'm going through at work and code and things like that. Um, and, you know, so that, that's kind of been 
my solution when management doesn't want to do it internally, I guess. <laughs> I think that's a really good point where you kind of have to find your own way to be social. And I think you also touched on a really interesting point too, which I think when you're in an office setting, you, if you're having trouble with your code or something like that, you can just pop in with another developer and start whiteboarding and ideating that way. We'd love to kind of hear everyone's perspective on how you've been able to do this like whiteboarding and making sure that you're getting through this code and kind of doing it in a way over this virtual setting. I don't know that my answer is good, but the side effect of I'm the only person in my company who writes JavaScript is I spend a lot of time talking out loud to my dogs. <laughs> and catching my own errors that way by just explaining it out loud a lot of times that helps me to um, just kind of like catch the logic in my problems and things like that. Uh, but when that doesn't work because they are dogs, not programmers, despite my best efforts, um, <laughs> you know, just, just grabbing somebody and just sending a message and being like, hey, I'm stuck on this. Let's walk through it um, and jumping on a call, looking at code together and really just walking through it. Um, towards the beginning of working remote, it was a lot of, I would jump on a call, I'd explain the problem, we'd hang up. And then sometime in the next day or two or three, I might get a response like, hey, I solved your problem. And I'm like, oh, cool, I forgot you were working on that. I solved it yesterday, but thanks. <laughs> um, so so kind of just staying on the call, not just like, here's the problem and passing it off, but being like, no, like, let's, let's really go back and forth on this. Like, what are you thinking? Can we try this together? Um, and and making those kind of be longer conversations instead of just like, here, I'm passing off my problem. Um, so yeah, that's my part. <laughs> Go ahead, Annalise. One, one thing that, um, that we try to do as much as possible is to keep everything in Slack. So even if I'm just talking to myself in <laughs> with my team, I'll be like, guys, I'm having problems with this. I'm going to thread my thoughts here, right? And then I just create this really long thread of me just like talking to myself or talking about my coding problems. Um, and it's like a form of rubber ducking, right? And talking to the rubber duck. And, and, you know, sometimes somebody will pop into my thread and be like, oh, have you tried this? Um, but it's nice because then there is a searchable, um, uh, history to go back on when somebody else is having that same problem or when I'm having that same problem again. Um, so that's been our whiteboarding is to ping people, start a thread, and then just go to town or start your own thread if you're working through your own problems. Janani, you're off mute. Would love to hear if you have some input there. Yeah, um, we actually work a lot with customers. And so sometimes what we do is we use the whiteboard app that we have or our teams. And then um, like, you know, like Annalise mentioned, kind of just jot things down or like draw things down. We, you know, we've kind of gotten, you know, that this beer Microsoft, but we use iPad Pros a lot with the stylus. They, they're amazing devices to kind of collaborate. And so uh, sometimes we just kind of make a note of, you know, if you have, if we had a whiteboard, we just write so much stuff on it. And sometimes, you know, that's, that, that has like stuff that we kind of mine data from. And so we try to do the same. We kind of try to write on that. Uh, but also in terms of calls, it's something that, you know, we, there are some folks who don't feel comfortable, but as much as possible, keeping the video on really helps. And like, you know, kind of picking up on, uh, hey, this person seems like they have a question uh, and, or there's some hesitation. Let's kind of get him, get them to talk and, and have, have that um, open conversation a little bit more encouraging that also really helps. Uh, it's, it's kind of the other aspect that we've kind of been finding it challenging is um, a lot of times there is talk over each other, like when we have video calls. And so uh, the hand raise or like, you know, making sure that we keep a note of things in, in the chat, like Annalise mentioned, is really useful to kind of ensure that everybody gets an opportunity to talk and we're, we're not kind of uh, call like we're not we're not making technology issues to kind of uh, come in between how we can interact. So. 
Awesome. Thank you. I think that's a really good point. Um, that kind of got me thinking a little bit too. Um, cause I noticed some people in the chat had mentioned a little bit about like building trust and stuff during this time. So would love to hear. Um, and I know Kelsey, maybe you could tell, tell us a little bit about how you're doing this over at handshake of how you guys are really continuing to build trust. You said that you had just started in January. And so what have you kind of been doing to continue to build trust with your team during this time? Um, I will start by saying I am definitely not an expert. Um, so be, take all of this with that huge asterisk. Um, but yeah, I, so I and another team member had started in January. We had a third team member who started in February. Um, and then I had three more team members who started after everybody went home in March. Um, and none of us were expecting to be remote. I have never managed remotely before. It's very exciting. Um, I think, so a couple of things that we were already doing that have played well continuing forward at Handshake, when we have a new person come onto the team, um, we assign them both an on our team and then like an off our team onboarding buddy that they are expected to pair with um, a lot their first couple of weeks with decreasing frequency, but indefinitely into the future once a week or so just continue to have a pairing session i think that has helped a lot um one big problem we had right after folks went home is if you had a question um, or like if i had a question i might just directly ping someone who i thought could answer it um it sounds like annalise kind of maybe hinted at a culture of doing this in a different way but we've retrained ourselves to like even if you have a person you kind of want to point your question at to just type the whole thing in the team chat so everybody gets to see the question everybody gets to see the answer um it's also really helpful because anybody can jump in if they have the answer and you didn't think they had the answer um so that that has helped a lot um obviously as a manager i do have weekly one-on-ones with everybody on my team which is a great opportunity to sit down and just talk to everyone either about work um, or you know just about their lives and, and what's going on so trying to find a balance and using those that time to, to still talk about career development to talk about things that are actively going on in terms of the office but also just to talk about life and what you did over the weekend and what you're thinking about for the future and where you're seeing the changes um, in your routine has been really big um, I think that's probably a lot of at least like the formalized process stuff. Um, I, I will definitely reiterate that that moving like as many private conversations as you possibly can into a public channel has been a huge change for the better. That's been really, really, really big. Um, and that's given. I think that's also forced us to be a little bit more intentional about our distribution of questions our distribution of to opportunities um, and hopefully because we're being more intentional we're also being more equitable um, and it's not just the person who happens to be sitting next to me or the person who was already in the meeting that I was in um, who who I turn to and ask um, so that I think has even been like positive I see a lot of head nods so if anybody wants to kind of piggyback off that feel free Well, Kelsey, you just nailed it. So <laughs> um, I think you talked a little bit like, oh, I think you talked a lot about kind of like that balance of like making sure that you're like keeping that check in and saying like, how are you doing with also like the work combo. And I think kind of going in a different direction with balance. Um, I think what a lot of people are experiencing during this time is kind of a misbalance when it comes to like being able to cut off from work and being not connected during this time a lot of people are like well i'm just home i might as well like work on something else um so would love to hear other panelists perspective on how you're managing that like work and home life balance during this time annalise i'm just going to call on you okay. jordan we're doing we're you're you're chiming in after Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm really, really strict about my routine. Um, 
it took me a while to get used to it, especially when I first started being remote and moving every couple of months to a new country. Um, and that's where I learned how important it was to just do one thing to mark, this is the beginning of the day, this is the middle of the day, this is the end of the day. Um, and even, it, and then when quarantine started, that was different, right? Even my routine changed. I couldn't go to the gym. I couldn't do, I couldn't, I couldn't go to class to uh, learn machine learning. Um, so I just kept doing the things that I normally did, like packing lunch. Even though I'm not like going anywhere, I'm still going to pack my lunch. Otherwise, I'm going to eat the entire kitchen. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> Right, so I like lay out my little snacks and like, okay, this, these are the snacks I would have taken with me if I was gonna go somewhere. Um, so setting my routine, I even though I'm not going to yoga every morning, I still block off that time every morning and I don't allow anyone to schedule meetings during that time. Most of my company is East Coast and that is my time in the morning to do what, what I need to do. Um, another thing that I do is I have like kind of like different days. So I have some days that are meeting heavy and I just kind of like know what flow I'm gonna get into. I have some days where I need to like deep dive into some code. And sometimes I mark that by like moving to the couch. And that's my like, my like code time is like couch time, right? Um, and then the, the other thing, oh, I do, I am fortunate enough to have a co-working space that's still open. Um, so if, after COVID, you do decide that you want to continue remote work. Um, I would recommend checking out co-working spaces um, and, and, they, and even joining one now, they're really diligent about keeping everything clean. Um, but yeah, so it's my, oh, and last thing is uh, scheduling async time on your calendar. So that's something that we do as a company and something that we've learned to do being remote for so long is to say the, this is when I am available for meetings on my calendar and this is when I am async and I am focusing on what I'm working on. I have Slack turned off. I'm not going to answer your pings and people really respect it because other people do it as well um, and it's really important to have that dedicated. This is when I am at my highest energy or my lowest energy and I can focus and I can get some of the stuff done that doesn't require meetings and collaboration. Um, so, so for, for me, the most helpful thing I did to kind of signify my end of day is basically teach my dogs that six o'clock is dinner time. Um, <laughs> so when it starts getting close to about six o'clock, they start coming over to me and they're like, hi, are you going to feed me? Are you going to feed me? And they just keep bothering me and bothering me and bothering me until I like stop and get off the computer and go feed them. And then they know after dinner, it's playtime. And then we go on a big walk and just like having them bother me, I guess, you know, the dog alarm clock um, has been really helpful. Uh, it definitely changed their dinner time from what it used to be, but uh, it works great as my end of day alarm. And um, kind of like some of you guys were talking about um, before with uh, like, you know, having your set routine and like signifying this is the end of the day. Like that's, that's my own little signifier. Okay. You know, I, this is my commute home. I take the dogs on a long walk after dinner um, has been uh, kind of fun. And um, like I, my personal computer is also my work computer because we don't have laptops because we used to be all in office. Um, so I just like VPN remote in um, and like just consciously signing off and turning off teams. And like on my phone, I can set like times that notifications can show up. So like after six o'clock, teams can't send me notifications um, and things like that. And just kind of being very explicit with my calendar um, like you were talking about before. Um, but yeah. The, the dog alarm is my favorite. You, you can't hit snooze on that one. <laughs> That's a really good point. And speaking from the perspective of having a new puppy, it definitely forces you to take breaks. <laughs> but Annalise, I love that too, of like setting like some time for like async to like get that heavy work done and that's a really good idea. And I really think during this time too, people have been super respectful of almost like changing your work, like how you work a little bit. You're like, I know I'm super productive in the morning. And sometimes at the office, people would like come over and chat, but it's like, now you're like, 
I'm doing this, you understand what my work schedule is and how I like to work. So I think that's really cool. Um, well, we're just at 650. So I want to make sure we're getting to some of our audience Q and A. So um, I'm going to kick off with what to expect when re-entering the workforce after getting laid off during COVID. Can anybody kind of give a little perspective on what online interviews are like right now? From my perspective, they're pr pretty similar to, to what we were doing before. Um, the biggest difference, actually, we talked about like whiteboarding and collaborating. There is obviously, even in the system design type portion of our interview, there is no physical whiteboard for you to write on. You're going to have to draw your own notes. Um, but a lot of it, um, a lot of it hasn't meaningful fully changed, to be honest. Uh, you'll probably be on a Zoom call with a couple of people at a time, depending on the interview process, answering behavioral questions, answering technical questions, uh, whatever the normal process is. Um, I don't know if that's helpful enough, but we were actually doing a handful of interviews remote um, before COVID really hit anyway, just because it's easier than flying people around or trying to work with people's schedules. Um, Tanani, you want to chime in? Yeah, uh, I mean, just to add on to what Kelsey said, I think we have a lot of tools. So we, we are right now doing remote interviews for coding interviews. We've actually uh, kind of have an option for the candidate to do a take home assignment. We've kind of found that that's a lot more realistic. And so we kind of send the take home assignment a week uh, before to the candidate, tell them to spend not more than three hours because we know that, you know, uh, it, we want to kind of assess how much or what, how they're prioritizing things in the three hours. And then, um, you know, we, we walk through that during the interview. We talk about how they went about prioritizing it. How did they, uh, you know, look at testing, unit testing and uh, documentation and all of that. That has been very helpful. I mean, we, we started this even before COVID and we've kind of found uh, that to be a little bit more effective than our whiteboard coding. And the second is there are tools like we use Codility and I think there are a lot of other tools there where uh, we log in and then, you know, you, it's pretty much an um, editor. You have like different uh, languages in there and we can watch as the candidate goes. We, we like, we don't, we only do that for candidates who prefer not to do the take home assignment. But um, as Kelsey said, I think it's been very similar. Uh, one of the things that I, I mean, I, I've kind of felt is for if candidates, we can't, we cannot mandate candidates to take turn on the video. And I found that the uh, I miss a lot on the body language and like, you know, picking up on the cues. So that has been the one uh, one thing that I would say is challenging, uh, but with video in, with, with video, video on, it's been pretty, pretty uh, seamless in terms of the interviews. Elise, go ahead. Um, so I was hired when I was living in Thailand and that was, it was just like business as usual, you know, you interview on Zoom and then you do your take home coding assignment and then you talk about it. And then I've interviewed um, a few people this year uh, before COVID and I feel like I can get a lot out of a 45 minute meeting with someone, like Janani said, as long as their video is on, um, in terms of are they a good fit or if I'm interviewing, am I a good fit? Um, so I think a lot of it, is, it, a lot of it is just business as usual. How do you present yourself? Are you prepared? And um, if it's technical, can you code? Yeah. Uh, there was one other thing I wanted to say, but I forgot it. Oh. I hate when that happens. I know. Wait, we were talking <laughs> about job interviews, coding, mm -hmm. remote. Nah, I'll think of it later. Thailand. Yeah, that I'll think of it later. Feel free to just like pop in when you're ready for it. <laughs> um, and so this kind of goes along the same line. For those who manage teams, how do you adjust to new team members, like new hires or transferred from other teams? How do you make them um, feel like they're in a team and learn the dynamics? So I know we kind of touched on that a little bit earlier, but if anybody would like to kind of add anything extra, feel free. I remembered what it was and I'll answer the question. Okay. <laughs> um, I think the funniest thing about hiring someone remotely or being hired remotely is that you have no gauge on how tall people are. 
Yes. So the first oh my goodness. The first time I met my whole company, my mind was just like blown. At like the people that I thought were really tall were really short. And I'm a really tall person, but I don't look really tall, right? Until you meet me. Anyway, so that was just funny. And I'm sure you all will experience it if you are hired or hiring remotely. Um, just know that don't set any expectations on height. <laughs> Um, what was what was the question again? I was going to answer. The second it. question was about managing teams and making people feel included. Oh, uh, one thing that we did uh, when we had new hires, just as a remote team, was require them to schedule one on ones with everyone that was on that like team. Maybe not even their direct team, like in the first month of them being hired. Um, and so that was a good way to make sure that people were included. We also have a, um, like an automated email tool that is like a know your team where you can ask questions and then everyone can just kind of asynchronously, asynchronously answer them and it'll send like a email out at the end of the week with the answers. But then we also do that with new hires. And so we have like all these like sets of questions about like what's the weirdest thing that you've ever eaten and like where are you coming from and where do you live and what does your desk look like? Um, so that was a good way to, it, it is still asynchronous, um, mm -hmm. but the one-on-ones the -on was really helpful because then you're, you, it's, the expectation is put on the new person to find a time on everyone else's calendar to meet within the first month to six weeks. Um, and it's a good way to make connections. We did do, you just reminded me when we all first went home and we haven't done this since we got new people. So maybe we should do it again. Um, but we encouraged folks to make kind of like a cribs video of their homes. And it was actually like a really, it was fun. You know, the movies are like three ish, three to four minutes long. I don't think we really put a time requirement on it, but um, it was just interesting to see where everyone lived and like where they'd set up their workspaces. And we have like, my team is based out of Denver, but we do have a full remote team and seeing where all the different types of places that the fully remote team lived was like really awesome. I hate to say that they were my favorite, but they were definitely my favorite. Uh, that was a really cool uh, little thing to do to just kind of get to know more about people, but quickly. I feel like I'm getting such great ideas to like bring back to team, like our team right now. <laughs> Um, one thing like we had done was like we did like kind of like a scavenger hunt where everyone got like the most ridiculous thing in your house that you could find like somebody brought back I think it was like like an old vintage scary doll <laughs> everyone's like no <laughs> put that thing away <laughs> you definitely learn some fun things about people in this setting <laughs> Um, well, kind of changing the tone a little bit, would love to kind of hear um, everyone's um, take on delivering and receiving feedback during this time. I think it's really important to make sure you're delivering effective feedback. Um, so would love to give or would love to hear everyone's interpretation on how they've been able to deliver feedback and make sure that they're still keeping a good team during this time. I have lots of opinions on this because my team did so badly at this at first. Um, like my, I, I have, a, you know, my, my own little weird sense of humor where like, and it worked really well in an office environment when I know the people and stuff like that. Um, and like my manager and I had this like little bit going on or something, I guess, um, where every time he asks me to do something, I say, no, you do it. And then I walk away and do it. And it worked really well in the office and it was amusing and he knew I was going to do the work, but all of a sudden we switched to remote and I did the same thing over chat and he went to like the owner of the company and was like, Hey, Jordan's like telling me, no, she's not going to do her work. And it was just like this whole big thing. Um, <laughs> so learning very quickly that um, a lot of the body language and like tone gets lost in text. Um, and making sure that when I am getting feedback from my manager, I am on a video call with him so that I can see these kind of the, the cues, like, is he just messing with me like we always did and, you know, kind of just playing off of each other and stuff like that? Um, or is he actually mad at me? <laughs> um, uh, and just kind of using the, the video and the audio to kind of get those uh, things back in there because when it was just all over text, it was getting lost and there was a lot of um, people getting really worried about like, oh shit, I'm like 
really messing up and what's going on. Um, we had a team member who thought they were like about to get fired because they like, because just how bad the feedback was coming across. So we've, we've really addressed that and it's very, very much has to be um, audio vid video. Um, so that said, so we still get some of those in-person cues because you really can't tell over text what the like tone and things like that are. Um, and just ge in, in, in general, being more explicit, like, hey, this is feedback. Um, you know, at the beginning of the conversation instead of it just kind of coming up naturally because it's uh, it's just harder to have the kind of organic conversations without it sounding like accusatory. Um, I'm noticing outside of the office, so just being really explicit, like, hey, I'm looking for feedback or hey, I'm giving you feedback right now um, has been really important. I feel like that reminds me of like the age old, like, writing okay versus like k <laughs> it's like there's such a misinterpretation that happens sometimes definitely depending um, on how many letters you use and all kinds yeah. of things it was very very dramatic in high school i recall <laughs> how about Janani? it looks like you just went off went off mute what's your opinion on the feedback situation yeah i think uh as jared had mentioned i think definitely having the video on is great but I, I mean, I do have sometimes one-on-ones with my my reports who, who for some reason don't like to turn on the video, and you know, the I, I the, it, this is something that Jordan mentioned too, and I think it's 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 a great tool, kind of saying, hey, would you like to, uh, would it be okay if I gave you some feedback? And that that thing just kind of turns and turns that button on in people in terms of okay you know I'm now going to a listening mode and you know this is this is something I want to listen. Uh, I've kind of found that to be extremely powerful to set the tone, and then you know give them feedback as you would you know normal directed and uh, kind of very um, straightforward feedback. So I think those two points were like you know I think Jordan touched on it, but I think those are great in terms of you know helping kind of land the feedback well. There's a book that I read at my last job that was called Thanks for the Feedback, and it was super helpful. So anybody looking to kind of get a little bit more understanding around feedback, I highly recommend it. Um, well, we are at 702, so we went slightly over, um, but just wanted to say thank you to all of the panelists for joining in tonight. Attendees, thank you so much for being here. I hope we covered a lot of what you were hoping to get out of tonight. I know from Myself, I learned so many great things and I'm very excited to take these back to our team. Um, and just like personally, I think there's a lot about like remote, like remote tech or techniques and things like that um, that I'm gonna be taking from this. Jen, do you wanna add anything else in? Yeah, no, it was awesome. I, I really appreciate all of our panelists. I also took notes. I am going to reach out to my manager about an Airbnb online experience tomorrow yes. because I'm so excited <laughs> for that. Uh, so thanks for the tips. And thank you for everybody who uh, came on to this call tonight. It's been awesome. Yeah. And I know that we are kind of lacking that like post-event networking. So feel free. Um, Emily just did throw like a little networking doc in there where you can put in your name, your LinkedIn. So if you want to connect after this. Um, also, we threw in a survey too, so we love to learn from these events, so let us know your thoughts. I'll share this with Jen too, so um, we'd love to hear your input on this event. Um, but yeah, thank you again for being here, and I hope that everyone can go and enjoy a glass of wine and listen to some soft piano music after this event. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, everyone, have a nice night. Thank you for being here. Bye.